Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Very happy to be here and uh, to support Jill, uh, who is one of my main guiding teachers. Uh, my name is Blakey. I'm actually located in Guelph here, and uh, my pronouns are she and her. And I thought I would just give everybody just a little bit of a background about me as we begin um, our kind of gathering here together with this talk that I wanted to offer tonight around Compassion Karuna. Uh, so I was first introduced to meditation in 2006 uh, when I took a year-long yoga training just out of interest and didn't know that meditation was part of it. So I did a bit of a deep dive into Vipassana and I would say I practiced off and on uh, from there, more off than on at that point in my life. Uh, life happened, I moved around and in 2013, I actually took an eight week program called mindfulness based stress reduction, um, which is a really specific interpretation of um, some of the teachings of the Dharma in a specific way. Uh, but it had a really profound impact on me when I realized how burnt out I was at that point in my life. Uh, I had two kids at that time that were quite young. I was working full time in mental health. And just the themes in the program really spoke to me and it kind of actually pushed me gently on this path to really learn more about uh, the Dharma and meditation. And so I actually connected with Jill only about five years ago because I was trying to find a way to practice and really study the Dharma a bit more in community with others. Um, so I found Jill just through an internet search and I was able to actually find one of her weekly groups that she offers in Fergus at the Victoria Senior Center. So I started practicing there weekly with that group with Jill a couple of years before the pandemic um, arrived on the scene for all of us. Um, but Jill supported me to do a two year community meditation teachers training program with True North Insight that we just wrapped up last year. So I am here to offer um, a bit of a reflection tonight on compassion. So if I can ask us all, if we're able to just take a moment to kind of land here together, a bit of an arriving or settling practice as we begin. And in this way, we're just starting to offer a sense of like being present with ourselves and with one another. So you might just take a moment to adjust your position in any way that you feel offers a bit more comfort, if that's available to you. You might just take a moment to just gently allow your sense of sight just to move around your space. And again, we don't need to rush to this. We can take our time. You might even consider just pressing your feet into the ground or moving the body in any way that just allows you a little bit of bringing a bit more connection. Feel a little bit more presence in this moment with ourselves, with each of us here. And I'd like to invite you to continue this focus on bring care to your body, to yourself, to your attention, any way that is needed for our talk and our practice together. So you're welcome to now bring attention back to the screen, or you may even choose to take an eye break and let the eyes rest and just bring more attention to your sense of sound. And so again, I'm going to offer some reflections tonight on compassion. Karuna is the Pali word for this. And two specific personal ways I want to share that I, I it's helped me really conceptualize like compassion. And tonight I want to offer a specific practice around setting this intention and cultivating compassion, especially when it's really, really hard to be gentle and to care for others or for ourselves sometimes. Um, and compassion I chose as this kind of discussion and reflection is just because it's so near and dear to my heart in my, in my work I do, in 
my life with friends and family. I really enjoy the role of caring for others, being in relationship with others. I work both as a therapist and a mindfulness teacher. And, you know, we start to, in these different ways, we come into contact with others and beings and people and all these expressions of life that we will come to know the suffering of others and to really bear witness to suffering of others. So just to situate for a moment the teachings on compassion, you may or may not know this, so it might be a repetition and that's okay. Um, you know, this was an oral tradition and repetition and lists were made to really assist us with these teachings. And so Karuna, the Pali word for compassion is from the Brahma Viharas. This is the Pali word too, to describe these dwellings of the heart and the mind of which there are four. There's metta, which is well-wishing, kindness, karuna, again, compassion, mudita, appreciative joy, and upeka, this ability to be kind of grounded and stable in the face of everything that's kind of going around. So in preparation for this offering tonight, I, uh, I have two kids. Uh, one's 11, one is 13. And as I had dropped the 13 year old off at school and I was driving the other one to school just last week, I thought I'm gonna ask him, what does he think of compassion? You know, like what does an 11 year old, what does this word mean for an 11 year old? So I said, you know, what do you think compassion means? And he said, oh yeah, showing you care. I was like, oh. Oh, that's so fantastic. Showing you care. And I went a bit further and just asked, you know, what would you be showing care for? And he said, if somebody's hurt or upset. And I just thought, oh, the Dharma of an 11 year old, how lovely. Showing you care when someone is hurt or upset. And how beautiful it is that kids can get this so quickly as well. So when we're starting to kind of move into this idea of compassion, connecting, being beside, being with the suffering of another and of ourselves, we actually start to really come to, to know the first noble truth, that there will be suffering in life. Another way that I like to look at it too, just this rephrasing too, and this kind of modern interpretations is you know there's no such thing as a pain-free life for any of us or for any being not that suffering is equal which it's not there's very very many unequal conditions of suffering for so many and yet we will all come to know discomfort disappointment discontentment pain in this life so this is like this first noble truth that this is going to be part of what we experience as being human. And so this can be, I find it a bit of a hard truth sometimes is this idea of like when we're actually experiencing or noticing or witnessing, you know, the suffering, the discomfort, pain of another, the desire is always to like quickly fix it or change it or get rid of it or avoid it or distract from it. So I want to just bring us into also this idea of the second noble truth, which is so important of these four noble truths, of that suffering arises when we desire, when we crave when we really want things to be other than they are, which for me, I go, well, that makes perfect sense. Nobody wants to feel pain, to feel discomfort, to suffer. And so our automatic response is often to like deny or not see clearly, um, to avoid almost or to fix right away. This comes so naturally. I spend a lot of time with this in my practice and daily life of just really noticing 
you know, the de quick desire to just push away, deny, to problem solve, to fix, and just how quickly this arises. And part of practice is going, oh, okay, I really am, I'm actually bypassing what's actually arising in this moment for myself or for another that's also having an impact on me. Yeah, I often say I have a gold medal in bypassing uh, the ability to kind of touch in sometimes and go, oh yeah, this is really difficult right now. Or seeing another's difficulty, seeing somebody struggle can just be so tight, you know, the clinging that can come with it of like wanting it to just go away, which is such a beautiful quality of to wish someone suffering or pain or challenge their difficulties to to not be present, to wish them to be easeful and to have peace. And yet if we quickly move past it into like trying to fix and change, you know, we're kind of over compensating. We're moving past the idea of like, oh, what is present in this moment? Ah, this is quite difficult. Yeah, and I... I for myself, I really like to think of how the Dharma and the teachings show in all these moments in life, as many, many teachers do and students do of, of the Dharma in this path. And when I was really thinking about uh, this talk to, to support Jill to, to fill in tonight for her, um, I was thinking about too and suffering and about three years ago, we, as a family, we, we got a dog, which was quite exciting. My lovely dog, I still have him. He's quite fantastic. Um, but in his first year, in the first few months, he actually got a really terrible condition called panosteitis that I had never heard of. And there was a lot of Googling and trying to look this up, but it means growing pains in large dogs. And so I would watch this sweet little puppy uh, start to limp, start to whimper. Um, and it was almost, it was absolutely completely intolerable and unbearable to see him in so much discomfort and pain and dysfunction too, because he would have to actually just hop on three legs and avoid using one of his limbs for a few days, almost a week sometimes. And so I remember just like putting myself back in this of like, oh, wow, it was so hard to really not try and just like rage and fix and want to like problem solve and take him to every vet possible to fix this pain that he was going through. So I was like, oh, yeah, here it is, like the desire to really wish suffering for any being, person or furry being all extensions of beings, you know, the desire for them to really have some ease and to suffer less. Um, so we did get some help with him and uh, which is wonderful, uh, veterinarian help. And, um, but the reality with it was it wasn't gonna go away right away. We were told it could come back every couple of months for a year or two. So this reality of, of knowing that, oh, it could come back it would pass after a couple of weeks and he'd be back to healthy and walking and playful. And then a couple months later, it would come back and he would be in pain and he wouldn't eat. And so part of the practice I was really trying to adopt was, ah, okay, this is really difficult to see him in pain and the pain I'm feeling from, from his suffering. Oh, compassion. Oh, here, this is what this is. The desire for his pain to be gone or a bit some, to ease in a way. So I know I was going to, there's a particular clip of a movie I was also thinking about sharing, but I think I'll just allude to it and uh, you can always look it up after, but I don't know if anybody has seen the movie Inside Out, but there is a specific clip in the movie in which um, 
Riley is the girl, the main character in the movie, and Bing Bong is her childhood friend. And slowly over time, Riley starts to like let go of some memories. And there's this one scene that I remember thinking, ah, that that for me really illustrates the actual practice of compassion is uh, Bing Bong loses his beloved like sled or sleigh that him and Riley would pretend they were going to the moon on. And this sled is starting to slide down and it goes. And so Big bon Bing Bong is really, really sad. And Joy immediately tries to like fix it. Oh, don't be sad, it's gonna be okay. We're gonna get to the train. Hey, look over here, let's go do this. But sadness, the blue character, is just watching and observing Bing Bong sit down and he's sad. And she goes and she just sits right next to him and goes, yeah, you're sad right now. Yeah, you and Riley had great adventures. And Joy would come and she's like, don't say that sadness. Like, no, no, you're going to make it worse. And I go, actually, what sadness is doing is recognizing the difficulty that Bing Bong is having right now of like a bit of a loss or a huge loss even. And just sitting with it and being with his sadness. I'm like, oh, this is compassion. This is what Karuna is, is recognizing, not moving to fix or change, but to be present with. And so there's this clip, it's a few minutes, just on Inside Out of sadness with Bing Bong, of rather than this quick fix and pushing away, sadness is just present with Bing Bong. Just saying, yeah, of course you're sad. This makes sense in a way, validating it, but really seeing it for what it is and not moving away from it. You know, this idea of we can, we have the ability to, to connect into deep, deep, great compassion for, for others, including for ourselves. So just taking a pause for a moment too, and seeing what may be arising, if anything, on this idea of really being with or beside or alongside another's suffering as well as our own. And what a beautiful thing it is to be able to do this and yet can be so difficult. And to also recognize like how difficult it can be to really have this beautiful quality of compassion and care for others, the planet, which so desperately needs our care or beings, when we might ourselves be suffering, you know, when we feel really depleted, when we're really fatigued, when we're active or activated, feeling like we have nothing left. These are these moments that it may be quite hard for us to just really care for and bring it forward in this heart-centered way for others. So it offers us the ability to offer our self-compassion, compassion for our challenge, for the difficulty that's here for us with this beautiful way of giving our self-care, maybe a bit of softness, maybe a bit of gentleness, you know, care for what is happening for us, where we too are really included in this wide open compassion. Again, we're talking about compassion, the witnessing, the observing, the suffering of another or others, and this wonderful desire and wish for it to end. But not trying to bypass what's, what's present by moving right into trying to fix and push away, but oh yeah, this is present. So mindfulness becomes a really large part of recognizing clearly what is arising within us, within our own heart and our minds and our bodies, when we come to really see and be affected by the suffering of others and ourselves. And as I was doing some research and readings on compassion for this, and I'm not even gonna remember, which is unfortunate, one of the readings I was doing, but, uh, 
was this idea of like not having aversion and ill will in those moments to really offer and connect into compassion. And so I was playing with this for the past couple of weeks of like, okay, these moments where I actually feel resource, where I feel rested, where I feel able, you know, there's no ill will in those moments. There's no aversion. Things feel good or they even feel neutral. And so I was like, oh, and then this is the way I can access having compassion, radiating compassion in all directions for all beings. And also just really observing these moments when things are hard for me, you know, things are like activated and like the difference there with like this desire is to just ease my own challenge in this moment, ease the impact of frustration that's having. So I was playing with these phrases for the past couple of weeks too, is like, okay, may, may I have a little bit of ease in this moment? May I be gentle with what's here? You know, may I care for what's arising? Another way I was trying to really phrase and think about karuna, compassion, is this idea of kindness in the midst of challenge, care in the midst of difficulty. You know, meeting what is here whether it's here in relation to noticing the difficulty another is having or it's in relation to a challenge we are having, but meeting what is here with the deep heart and care of compassion. And I was also, I, I watched a talk quite a while ago from Insight Meditation Society Um I've forgotten the name of it. It's free, but they have all these wonderful audio recordings. And I was listening to other recordings on the Brahma Viharas, and there was one offered by uh, Jimmy Corrigal, if I'm saying their name correctly, um, on Karuna. And just saying sometimes when we are trying to access compassion and its care for ourselves and for others, we might need to bring to mind beings that have cared for us and are supportive or bringing to mind teachers we have on this path it might be friends could be beloved pets that we feel this warmth and connection with it could be ancestors that remind us of compassion and how to access this quality or people in which you can bring to mind that you have seen you know compassion in practice compassion in action So I love this idea of like, not just having to do it ourselves. You know, we can pull on these other resources we have, bring to mind people, teachers, you know, as a support for us to remind us of this quality of compassion. And I wanted to share a short, a very short story before I move us into practice together. Um, it just happened today. My, my mom um, was sharing she was grocery shopping today. She's in here. She lives in Guelph. Um, she's with us now, which is great. But she was just grocery shopping. And there was a man in the store holding a big bunch of red roses, she said, a big bouquet. And so my mom, who's quite vocal and talks to everybody, was like, oh, wow, someone sure is lucky making a joke. Uh, to this man who was holding this bouquet and as she's at the checkout you know getting her groceries he came up to her and he had bought her her own bouquet of yellow roses just as a gesture of compassion and care of kindness and he just wished her a good day and she said he just walked out of the grocery store with his own roses and there she was with this bouquet of roses that had caught her right off guard but I wanted to share that because it fills me up with all the ways the Brahma Viharas these divine abodes can really help us and fill us with great joy great compassion so this really this story really nourishes me I can feel it in my my body easing a little bit more right now and 
this idea too of accessing kindness and compassion for others, that we all have the ability to offer great compassion to all beings and to others. And I'm going to say this one phrase before we move into the practice I'd like to offer and guide us in is, and I think I got this from Jill, but I feel bad. It's just, it's here right now, but, you know, compassion is always a wise, skillful response to suffering. Compassion is always a wise and skillful response to suffering. So I'd like to offer a chance to practice compassion now through both phrases, but the felt sense if we're able to access it of compassion, care for ourselves. So this will be about a maybe about a 15 to 20 minute practice if that helps you in some way of, of how best to support your body, of how best to support your attention. You may choose a different position now, or you may just continue in the one you've chosen. But taking this time now. Practice is a bit similar if you've had any experience or you've done any type of a meta practice where we're invited to bring to mind a particular person, such as a good friend or companion, and you know, reciting or offering some phrases. And so there's many ways that we can touch into this practice of compassion just as one way. But I thought we could start just by feeling into this felt sense. So might begin to feel into just the sense of the body right now. You might take a moment to really feel the connection of the feet on the ground, the earth. You might choose to have the eyes closed to support attention, or you might choose to have the eyes open and just focus somewhere that feels very easy and restful for the gaze to land on. Noticing any sensations of where the body is coming into contact with a chair, a cushion, perhaps the floor, and just noticing if there's any sense of kind of being held or a sense of stability. it feels available and supportive for you, you might just start to move attention onto sensations of the breath in the body.
It might be just a gentle movement you sense in the body of the shoulders just gently rising up and down ever so slightly with the breath. The arms at the sides of the body, maybe just noticing a gentle connection as the ribs expand out to the sides, touching the arms slightly. Or you might offer yourself another gesture if it feels Available, maybe just placing one hand on top of the other hand, gently holding and caressing the fingers, the thumbs. Perhaps a sense of warmth might be present. Just seeing in any way if we can connect into this sense here of a bit of stability. Of connection. Perhaps in some ways, even a bit of care. but a gentleness. So you may choose to actually continue practice in this way. This way of actually offering compassion, some ease for ourselves. I'm going to guide us though in offering some phrases as well in a particular way. And so if you'd like to join in, the invitation is to actually bring to mind a a good friend or a companion that you find is quite easy to be with. Even be a beloved pet. Just offering these phrases. May you find some ease. May you be gentle. May you know you are not alone. You find some ease. May you be gentle. May you know you are not alone.
May you find some ease. May you be gentle. May you know you are not alone. Just noticing what may be arising, if anything, in the heart center, in the body. You might choose to connect back into the sense of the body's position for a few moments, or you might connect into a sense of ease somewhere in the body that feels welcoming. And inviting now into our wide open compassion practice, someone going through a hard time right now. Someone we may know or we may not. If you'd like offering these phrases, may you find some ease in the midst of this. May you be gentle in the midst of this. May you know you are not alone. May you find some ease in the midst of this. May you be gentle in the midst of this. May you know you are not alone. May you find some ease in the midst of this. May you be gentle in the midst of this. May you know you are not alone. Again, we're just cultivating this felt sense or even intention of compassion, care for the challenge, the difficulty, the suffering of another. bringing to mind now ourselves. Where we are always included in this compassion as best as we can. Sometimes this is hard.
May I find some ease? May I be gentle? May I know I am not alone? May I find some ease? May I be gentle? May I know I am not alone? May I find some ease? May I be gentle? May I know I am not alone? In this way, including ourselves in this great heart of compassion. And extending the sense of compassion now to all beings. May all beings find some ease. May all beings be gentle. May all beings know they are not alone. May all beings find some ease. May all beings be gentle. May all beings know they are not alone. May all beings find some ease. May all beings be gentle. May all beings know they are not alone. I'm just taking time to just connect into what might be arising in the heart center, if anything, or within the body. Taking a moment to see about expanding attention a little bit wider throughout the entire body. The sense of the entire body being present. You might even consider expanding attention to include sounds. And if I might just offer these final phrases that Larry Yang offers in a, an essay or article he wrote called In the Moments of Non-Awakening. We're in these moments that we find really hard. May I be loving, open, and aware in this moment. If I cannot be loving, open, and aware in this moment, may I be kind. If I cannot be kind, may I be non judgmental. If I cannot be non judgmental, may I not cause harm. If I cannot not cause harm, May I cause the least harm possible.
We're beginning to start to bring our compassion practice to a gentle close. You might start to move the fingers or toes or move the body in any way that feels supportive. Taking the time to open the eyes if they've been closed. We have a few minutes. If there's anything anybody wants to ask or add in any way, I want to thank you for your practice, for being here, practicing compassion.